And so 90% of what I do is lifestyle. So when I when I'm training people or when I'm working with people, I'm working with clients, I'm trying to explain to them this body is a couple of hundred thousand years old, right? It evolves to be on this planet to be awake during the day and asleep during the night. In fact, it evolves to be awake for 16 hours and sleep for eight hours. You're born into that contract, just like you're born into the contract that you're gonna die one day. You don't, you don't get to negotiate that. You need eight hours of sleep for 16 hours of being awake. Everybody does. Doesn't You can't be better than that. You can't hack your way out of that. Okay, I've got something exciting to share with you. Over the past few months, my team and I have been working hard behind the scenes to create something special for you, my listeners. If you're an executive, entrepreneur, or other high performer looking to lose 20 to 30 pounds of fat, transform your body, and to do it all without giving up your favorite foods or your social life in the process, then you're going to want to hear this. I've never done anything like this before, but I'm confident it's going to help you win big with your health in 2022. So if you're excited to see what I have planned to help you, go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash Facebook to join my exclusive Facebook group. Again, that's legendarylifepodcast.com slash Facebook. See you inside. What is up, my friend, and welcome back to the Legendary Life Podcast. Of course, I'm your host, like always, Ted Rice, coach to entrepreneurs, executives, and other high-performing professionals. And today, I've got Dr. Kirk Parsley back on the show for a new conversation about sleep. Now, if you don't know Dr. Kirk Parsley, if you haven't heard my other episodes with him, he's a former Navy SEAL turned sleep medicine specialist. And he has a very unique perspective into sleep, stress, how to manage it so that we achieve high performance in the big areas of our life, our, with our health, with our relationships, and in our careers. And do I really need to say more than that? He's a former Navy SEAL turned medical doctor. Do you need any more convincing? And for those of you who've heard my previous interviews, you know he always brings it. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with Dr. Kirk Parsley. Dr. Kirk Parsley, thanks so much for coming back on the show and uh, being patient with some of the technical difficulties involved in uh, recording from you know Florianopolis, Brazil, all the way to where you are in Austin, Texas. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, man, my, my pleasure coming on. And I've, I, uh, I'm, you know, I run an internet based business and I, you know, do consulting over Zoom. So I am 100% used to all the technology issues. You know, you do, I do Zoom recordings literally every single day and third of the time they don't work. And I'm just like, I do, I do the exact same thing every day. (laughs) How is it not working today? Yeah. But we'll, uh, soldier on. Soldier on, right? Yeah. There's a great Navy SEAL saying, isn't there, about pushing on when things are... I went to the Navy SEAL Museum in Florida, and there was all these great quotes. And Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of them. The most, the most famous one is, the only easy day was yesterday. Mm. Um, you know, like you got to, you got to earn it every day. Like don't, don't, don't ever think there's an easy day. If it's easy, you're doing something wrong. You're, you're quitting as we'd say in the team. That's the worst thing you do is be a quitter. Like you ever quit. You're the, you're the worst thing on the planet. <laughs> Tough group to hang around. <laughs> Tough group to high performers, no doubt. Yeah. And uh, yeah, really. Yeah. I just watched some Navy SEAL movies recently. And of course it's highly dramatized in sure. Hollywood. Sure. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, the, uh, you know, it's just amazing what you guys do. And um, I would love to, even though you've been on this show a few times, and if you're listening right now, if you haven't listened to uh, Kirk Parsley's The Power of Sleep with Dr. Kirk Parsley, that's episode 138. You want to check that one out. And also um, 398 Sleep Guidelines, Immune System and Coronavirus with Dr. Kirk Parsley. So those two, I'll I'll, uh, remind you at the end. Um, again, but you want to check those out as well. Uh, but Kirk, I would love to hear a little bit more about, even though you've been on the show, you shared a bit of the story, but a little bit of the, the Navy SEAL 
journey again, because it's just something that we have a lot of new listeners. We get a hundred thousand downloads uh, a month now, which yeah. before it was <laughs> not that much. Yeah. Uh, so could you, could you share a little bit about how you got into health, how you got into specifically really preaching about sleep and, you know, what did your time in the teams have to do with all that? Right. Right. Well, um, you know, as we talked about before, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I got interested in health and wellness and fitness at a very, very young age, probably pathologically young. Uh, but you know, it, it was a thing I gravitated to. I just wanted to be big and strong and athletic. And like, that's, that was when I was a boy, that's all I wanted. And so, you know, I, I'd always been into it, started lifting weights early, competing and lots of things early, competing in sports, doing martial arts, all that stuff, all to the detriment of my academic career, which I didn't care at all about. I thought school was the most boring place in the world. I had no interest in ever being there. I hated it. Uh, and my grades reflected it. Did really poorly in school, dropped out of school, got a GED because I wanted to go do what I recently learned uh, because uh, there's a news journalism show a lot like 60 Minutes back in the 80s. It was called 48 Hours and they would cover something for 48 hours, obviously, and uh, they covered SEAL training and this was touted as the toughest training in the world. And I'm like, I can do the toughest training in the world, so I want to go see if I can do that. So. Yeah, that's what I did. Uh, really didn't know what a seal was, to be honest. Like, you know, wow. loosely, loosely had some kind of idea uh, what they what they were. You know, like I knew they were like Rambo kind of right. Like that was about. You know, I was a kid. I didn't know anything. Um, I didn't even know the Navy was going to pay me. Like I was in the Navy for a couple of months before I found out they were going to pay me. I did. I had. I was like, why would you pay me? I didn't I'm like, I, you're giving me food. You give me a place to live. You, know, you give me clothes. What are you money for? You know? uh, so that, that's how naive I was, but I just wanted to go do the training. And so I did. And then, uh, you know, went, uh, went to the SEAL teams on the West coast. Um, you know, uh, in those days, each SEAL team kind of had its own operational area. We had Southeast Asia. Uh, so we went, you know, to the Philippines and Thailand and Singapore and, uh, some Micronesia stuff, um, you know, and, and, you know, we would work with, we'd, we'd work with and train, uh, other militaries, uh, special forces. We'd work with kind of special units and police departments and do, you know, kind of police work and work a little with the FBI and do some drug interdiction stuff, but we didn't have like this post nine 11 combat stuff. So, um, I'm not one of those dudes with the big grizzly beard and all the kit strapped all over me and, you know, the, all the combat experience in Afghanistan and then Iraq and all that. So, uh, you know, I, I was pre pre nine 11 and, you know, I, I, uh, you know, my, I, I started dating a woman who was, uh, getting her master's degree in physical therapy and she, she, you know, became my wife later, but, um, while, while I was in the SEAL teams, I'm dating her and, I was taking her textbooks on deployment to read because, you know, I, there were things I was interested in, you know, I was like, you know, biomechanics, kinesiology, anatomy, physiology, some nutritional stuff. And I just, I'd go read her textbooks. And so I thought well, maybe I could be a physical therapist, right. Or, you know, something along those lines, athletic trainer. And so uh, I, you know, I got a little, I got a little older, my, my brain finished developing and I decided, well, maybe I, you know, I don't have to just, lift heavy things and be aggressive all the time. Maybe I could do something intellectual. And so I thought I'd, I'd go to college and see what else was out there. And I started, had to go to junior college, obviously, because I had a GED. And uh, so I uh, started at junior college. I started volunteering at San Diego Sports Medicine Center because you have to have 2000 volunteer hours just to apply to a physical therapy school. And that's what I was thinking I would do. And then they, they pretty quickly hired me and I became a physical therapy assistant. And I would, you know, kind of do the same thing physical therapists did. I was just under their supervision. And I pretty quickly decided that wasn't right for me. Uh, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, but San Diego Sports Medicine Center was this amazing healthcare mecca. They had every kind of healthcare practitioner you can imagine. You know, they had uh, massage therapists there. They had acupuncturists come through. They had 
podiatrists come, you know, work there. They had, you know, we had doctors, we had, M, you know, we had MDs and DOs. We had orthopedic surgeons and family practice guys. We had physical therapists. We had physical therapy assistants. We had athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches. Uh, you know, so we kind of had everything. And, and I got to, I, I had the opportunity to just follow people around and work with people and get to know them. And, um, you know, the doctors there, I, I, I kind of gravitated towards them. They gravitated towards me. I don't know which, and, and they, you know, they weren't because I'd been a seal. I'd, I'd spent seven years essentially uh, going through training and being a seal. And so now I got out. So these guys weren't that much older than me. You know, they're like four or five years older than me. And uh, you know, they're, they're talking up saying you should go be a doctor. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm a high school dropout. I'm not going to be a doctor. Right. Uh, didn't, didn't think that was even a possibility. Well, and one of the, and the, actually the senior doctor there who, who owned the clinic, a guy named Dr. Lee Rice, who I would work, who I worked with when I actually got out of the Navy, I went back and worked in his practice, but he comes out of his office and he says, you know, Kirk, the question isn't, could you get into medical school? The question is, would you go if you got in? Mm. It's like, I was like, of course I would. He's like, then you have to try. Right. <laughs> I was like, so he kind of guilted me into it. I'm like, all right, so I got to do it. You know, I I did uh, I did my you know undergrad and you know did really well and took the MCAT and did fairly well. Uh, I probably you know, I probably wasn't going to get into Harvard or Yale, but I could get into probably most schools. I was competitive for most schools, but before the internet, you had to go down to the bookstore and get the Kaplan School mm-hmm. Review and like figure out which schools you're competitive for. And it was at that time when I was applying to medical schools that I found out the military had their own medical school. Because to me, like the military was a closed chapter in my life. I'd done it like, you know, I, I grew up kind of rural Texas, like 12th generation Texan. Like, it, you know, we it's just kind of expected you're going to go to the military, you're going to go do your, your service, right? And that's just, it's, it's a really common thing in my family. So uh, just always knew I'd do it and I'd, kinda, I'd done that and I was going to do something else. But at this point, I was already married. I already had my first kid. And I, and I found out the military had their own school and they would pay me to go to medical school. So me paying someone else to go to medical school. And because I had time in as enlisted, that time coming towards pace, I was actually going to make enough money to support my family while I went to medical school. So allowing my wife not to work and stay home with the kids and so it was a no brainer. And I, you know, the way the military works, they'll train you to, they'll train you to do anything if you're competitive to get into their program, but the game is you pay them back with your time. So, mm. and it's usually about a two to one. So they'll train me to be a doctor. It takes four years, but then I got to stay there for eight years and be a doctor. Yeah. You know, and so it's 12 years in, in the Navy, you know, t- to be a doctor, essentially four years in training and four years and eight years as a doctor. And I figured I would get back to the SEAL teams as, as a doctor there. That would allow me to get back to the community that was, you know, hugely formidable and shaping who I became as a, as a man and as an adult. And uh, I did. Obviously. I got back to the SEAL teams. You know, all of my training was focused around orthopedics. I was you know, dad said I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon after I did my, what in the military, they call it a utilization tour, which is basically you do one year residency and then you go and you do what's called a utilization tour, which means they send you out to some command or, you know, that needs a doctor and you work sort of as a general practitioner. Uh, otherwise everybody in the Navy would just specialize and you wouldn't be able to get any GPs anywhere. So, so they send me back to the SEAL teams. I'm the doctor there. I get there right at the time there's the congressional funding had come through to build our very first sports medicine facility. And so uh, obviously had a great pedigree for that. They put me in charge of, of that build out. Uh, I worked with the teams building it. I worked with you know other leadership and the SEAL teams to hire our first nutritionist and our first athletic trainer and our first strength and conditioning coach and our first physical therapist and our first physical therapy assistant and built this beautiful facility. And had ortho rounds. So we had the ortho from the hospital coming through and doing rounds once a week. We had the, the Department of Pain Management in the hospital. They would come through and do rounds. We had an acupuncturist coming through. We had a chiropractor coming through. So at this point, I'm the least qualified guy. I'm the dumbest guy around now because every, like, you know, and we didn't hire 
Joe blows off the street. I mean, we hired people from the Olympic training center from professional sports teams. And, you know, like we hired hot, you know, top, top caliber people. And so, you know, in the military, what do you do when you're the dumbest guy around? They, they put you in charge and say, you're the, you're, you're the leader, right? Like you're in, so, so now I'm like leading uh, this clinic uh, but I really didn't have much of a job, you know, uh, I couldn't really go in to do like the regular stuff that doctors usually do. There's just kind of like day-to-day sick calls, sniffle sneezes, following up on, you know, mending injuries, uh, you know, following, you know, th- those types of things, just, um, you know, just general practitioner kind of stuff. So I, d- I couldn't really do that and manage a clinic. So I, I lived in the clinic and patients would come see me. If, if it was beyond what the clinic could do, uh, you know, whoever was in the clinic. And the most important part of this story, though, is that is the mentality of the, the culture of the SEAL teams. So SEALs are just like professional athletes. Their job is the most important thing to them. Some people would argue with me, but let me say, they behave as though their job is the most important thing to them, even, even if they say their priorities are slightly different, um, but it's up there for everybody. And um, the worst thing that you can do is put them on the bench. I mean, that is do anything else to them, decrease, demote their rank, humiliate them, call them names, take away money. Nothing is as bad as getting taken out of your job. Uh, so they don't want to be on the bench. So when they go see doctors and other healthcare providers who can disqualify them, they just lie and they just <laughs> say nothing is wrong. Feeling really fine. fine. I feel fine. I'm terrific. You know, uh, the literally hide injuries, you know, like, uh, you know, it, it's really bad. I mean, they'll get, you know, they'll get like steroid injections so that they can move their shoulder good on the day you're going to evaluate them and say, look, my shoulder's fine. Like no problem. Or, you know, but because I'd been a seal, uh, and because there were still, I'd been a seal recently enough to where there were still plenty of seals around that I had been a seal with, and I'd been through training with, and I'd done deployments with platoons with, and so they trusted me and they would come in my office and say, Hey, let me tell you what's really going on with me. And they, you know, they shut the door and uh, it was all kind of hush hush. And, uh, and they knew I wouldn't disqualify them. And I, and of course I didn't, but they came in and they said, you know, my mood is all over the place. I go from being angry to being sad, like instantaneously. And for no discernible reason, I can't concentrate to save my life. I, you know, I have to ask people five, six times what they just told me. I can't pay attention in briefings. I kind of have this underlying sense of anxiety. My sex drive sucks. I, I'm snappish and angry and mean to my kids and my wife. My body composition shifting. I'm getting fatter and weaker, but I'm eating perfectly. I'm working out exactly how I'm being trained and taught to work out. I'm doing everything right. You know, my cognition just sucks. Like I walk in a room. I can't remember why I was there. I walk out. I remember I walk back in. I can't remember again. And they'll just like, you know, but maybe I'm just getting old, doc. Right. And, and they really believe that they really think maybe they're just getting old. Cause they're, they're like 28. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I was going to say like 32, right. They come 32. In like 32 years old. It's like still ripped six pack abs, big muscular. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're just old. <laughs> it's, it's all, it's all over. Like you might as well start digging your grave now. I mean, that is like, but that, you know, it's a culture where, you know, it, it focuses around young. You have to be really resilient, you know, fit, be made of rubber to do that job. And so I honestly didn't have the slightest idea how to help them. I, you know, I was a medical doctor. I'd been trained in Western medicine. I'd been trained how to recognize and treat disease. They didn't have disease. Like, First thing I did was just test every lab I could possibly think to test. Right. I didn't know what I, I didn't know what I thought I was going to find, but I was just like, well, let's just do it all, all right? You know, so like I'll do the full panel. And actually the panels I was doing back then was just uh the consensus with they were just ridiculous. I got in trouble many times from the navy saying it was wasteful. But you know, with the with the advent and progression of functional and integrative medicine the panels I did back then would now be pretty normal, right? Like it, it, they were, they were robust, but you know, I would do a full hormone panel, a full blood panel, uh, inflammatory panel. Um, you know, I would, uh, let's see, uh, you know, I, I would do the best chem, which is, you know, sort of like a metabolomics multi by, you know, sort of, a, a nutritional, um, mineral, I mean, they, they don't quite classify the way they classify now, but basically I just, 
I do serum labs. I do urine for some things. I could do 24 hour cortisol catch if I thought that they had some cortisol issues. And I just kind of tested everything. And when, and I saw this pattern that they had low testosterone, but the, so the scale in the military, you know, it, you the acceptable or usual range or normal range, it depends on who, who's referring to it, how they refer to it, but it's kind of the reference range that you're looking at. And for the, for the lab sets that I was using for the, for the lab that I was using, the normal testosterone was 250 to 1100 for a total. That's a pretty big range. But when you, when you learn that, you know, how they figured that range out, that range comes from Framingham and the Framingham, as you might know, is like, it's a small town in Massachusetts, they 30 or 40 years, all they did is collect data on this town because it was a fair, it was a decent sized population, but had very little influx and outflow. So like people- This is a Framingham, Framingham heart study, right? Yeah. But they collected a lot of more data. Right. right. Okay. And so they just collected everything they could think of. New labs would come out, they'd start- collecting it you know, over the 30 or 40 years and they just collected it and banked it. But they, you know, their criteria for you having normal testosterone was that you had to be male, you had to have your testicles and you had to be alive. And that was it. You meet those three criteria and you fell into the normal range. So you can imagine that 250 is probably the 81 year old man sitting in the nursing home and the 1100 is like the 19 year old athlete, right? I mean, Right. Intuitively, this makes sense. But in, you know, in academia, it's like, this is just the normal range. So I'd have a 32-year-old, 220-pound, muscular, fit, lean, maybe sealer in front of me with a total testosterone of 256. And if I send him to endocrinology, normal. normal. He's inside that normal right. range. Or I'd send him with like 238 and they would retest him and he'd come back 251. And they'd be like, normal. All right. Uh, so anyway, I would see low testosterone. I'd see all low anabolic markers. So things like IGF-1 is the downstream product of growth hormone, DHEA, pregnenolone. These things are like precursors to the testosterone. DHT, again, thyroid function, anabolic. And they would, they would be off on all this. Like their anabolic markers would be low, their catabolic or inflammatory markers, stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, those, all of these things would be high. So Catabolic high, anabolic low. And that doesn't make sense with a young, fit male who eats well, exercises, right? And all this. So they, you know, they would, they would get their labs. They'd come back and see me. I'd talk to them. We're just trying to figure things out. I immediately just start looking into alternative stuff. Fortunately, I was in this great position being able to, being the SEAL, the doctor for the West Coast SEAL teams. That was you know, the seals had already killed Bin Laden and been in movies, and so they had this kind of quasi celebrity status. And so I could see a TED talk or go to a lecture or read somebody's book, and I just call them and say, "Hey, I'm the doctor for West Coast SEAL teams. I really like your work. It's very informative to me. Could I, you know, could I pick your brain for a bit? Could I, you know, could I consult on clients with you? Could I come train with you?" And and all these guys, everybody I called was very gracious. Like, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. And so I got to learn a lot really quickly. And, and so when I first started out, I thought this was adrenal fatigue and I thought adrenal, you know, I thought this is, well, this is like what they called combat fatigue or shell shock and like post and old wars. And this is adrenal fatigue is the new term for the same phenomenon. It's kind of what I thought. And a lot of guys, you know, fit that sort of definition, um, which in, in the, in the true medical you know, academic medical world, you would call an HPTA mismatch. So a mismatch between what's going on in your brain and the organs below that, that are supposed to be controlling. And um, so I would, you know, these people would, you know, the cortisol curves, I do salivary, you know, cortisol catches, ASIs, adrenal stress index on them. And I, I would test their cortisol and it just, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Sometimes it would just be completely inverted. Sometimes it would be a flat line and just super low. Uh, sometimes there was no predictable pattern whatsoever. And so I was like, oh, it's an adrenal issue. And so I started treating for that. Navy didn't like me doing that either because that was beyond my scope. Uh, giving people IV vitamins was beyond the scope of a medical doctor somehow. Uh, so they kind of cracked down on me for that. And, you know, after, and, and the SEAL community is very, uh, it's a very tight culture. And so when, when one guy would come to me and tell me a story, whether I could help him or not, he felt 
he felt relieved that he got to share that with somebody who he thought could help him and somebody who was willing to help him. And so they would tell their friends. And then obviously if I had success with anybody, he definitely told his friends and then, you know, word of mouth, you know, every guy tells two other guys. And I was flooded with these guys really quickly. And I'd say about the hundredth guy who was in my office said something about taking Ambien every night. Mm. And I just, I can remember so clearly like where I was sitting, how I was sitting, where he was and just like this light bulb going off in my head. And I was like, I think a lot of guys have said that to me. And I kind of made a note in the margin and I'm going to look that up after this visit. So we have our visit. He goes off. I start flipping back through all the old files that I have. Every single guy who had been in my office was taking Ambien, if not every night, very regularly. And so I was like, well, I wonder if Ambien's causing problems. And I had taken pharmacology in medical school and I knew the mechanism of action for Ambien, but that was about it. I could read about the side effects, but you have to know a significant amount about how sleep works before you really understand what it means to have a GABA analog working in your brain, right? So if you're just like, well, it acts like GABA and GABA helps you sleep. And that's about as much as you learn in medical school. But what does that mean? So like, how could that affect the normal physiology of sleep? So that was a really, really deep rabbit hole that I had to, you know, I spent a long time. I mean, I would say it was at least 18 months before I was reasonably smart on that. Cause it's just, you know, it, it's a messy subject. You know, because there are hundreds, if not thousands of things changing in your brain, like every second, every minute while you're asleep, depending on what phase of sleep you're in and like all sorts of things are. So, you know, at least the postulate was there. It's like, okay, well, when you understand what sleep is, and I didn't, I didn't understand what sleep was. And I guarantee you go pull 99.9% of all doctors who just graduated medical school. They don't know what sleep is either. Uh, because we don't learn. Right? I never had a lecture on sleep. I didn't know anything about it. And so once I learned what sleep was and what the, what the benefits of sleep were, then I could say, okay, well, if this drug causes a decrease in deep sleep, or if this drug causes a deep sleep and a decrease in REM sleep, or if this causes, you know, um, you know, whatever, however it changes your sleep architecture, then I could say, well, that would likely lead to these symptoms. And when I, when I got to that point, I was like, this could literally explain every problem that SEALs are having. Now, I wasn't naive enough to think that it would, right? And I thought there was probably something else going on, but this was at least one thing that I thought would make a big difference. So what I really wanted to do is go fix their hormones because I was a doctor and I was like, I can give them hormones. I can give them testosterone. I can, you know, I can give them something to block their DHT. I can give them something to decrease their estrogen. I can give them thyroid. I can like, I wanted to go fix all this, but you can't do that. Right. Cause these guys are active duty seals who knows where they're going to be, how long they're going to be gone. They can't be dependent upon medication. So if you do that, you put them on the bench. So I wasn't allowed to do that. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to figure out what I can do. So when I would talk to the seals, I would tell them this is true. And I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't being misleading. It was, um, but I knew what would motivate them was performance. And so I would talk to them about how sleep affects their testosterone and their growth, you know, their IGF one levels, their growth hormone levels, their thyroid function, their, their uh, adrenal function, how it affects their body composition, how it affects their appetite, how it affects, you know, their fuel partitioning, their insulin sensitivity, all of this stuff. And they knew what this stuff was. And so they would, they would take on the idea of sleep. Because if you think about it, SEALs, any special forces, but SEALs maybe more so than most, this is not an organization that values sleep. You right. know, I, I, like it, sleep is something weak people do. Uh, you know, you sleep when there's nothing else to be done and you have time to sleep. Otherwise, you don't need sleep. It's a mind, it's a mind game. You just, if you're tough mind enough, over matter, right? Yeah, yeah, if you're tough enough, you don't need that. Yeah, I probably chose the worst two professions in the world for sleep, right? Doctors and SEALs. Yeah, yeah doc, I mean, like, I, I can't tell you how many times I worked 48 hours in a row at a hospital. And like, I know that now it's like, that was ridiculously dumb. <laughs> like, like, that is so you irresponsible. You the wrong hand, yeah. man. You know, yeah. It's like, it's oh, so sorry. Irre- it's, it's so irresponsible. It's so it's so irresponsible. It's, it would be hysterical if it wasn't potentially traumatic, right? Like it's just right. because it, you're already a young, dumb doctor. It's like, you know, some textbook stuff, but you don't know much about doctoring. Like that's why you're there is to learn and to be supervised. Well, you're sleep deprived. So you're even dumber and you're working for staff members who are also sleep deprived. 
and you're all working together, right? And so it's a, it's like a group ignorance. Like everybody's getting dumber over the day, and you're all all working hand in hand. So anyway, you know, the SEALs had these uh, retreats where they would uh, before SEAL team would deploy, they'd bring the whole, uh, they'd bring all the people who are deploying and all their families, and they bring them to a resort, and they spend three or four days with them lecture, you know, giving them lectures, giving them material, letting them talk to people and like preparing them for deploying. Obviously, most of these people have deployed before, but a fair number of them, this is going to be their first deployment and a fair number of them are married with kids. And so it's like you're setting expectations for both sides. And then when they came back from deployment, you did the same thing, Uh, kind of like teaching them how to wind down, here are the things to look for, for PTSD-like symptoms or the types of things that interfere with the with the with the utility of the force and the health of the force, and that we'd bring in all these guest lecturers. And you know, if there was somebody who was popular, who was really hot in the in the health and wellness space or psychology space that related to this, like you know, we'd bring in uh, uh, Colonel Grossman to talk about you know the psychology of killing, right? Because he has that book on killing. We'd bring in Rob Wolf to talk about nutrition. We'd bring in John Wellborn to talk about strength and conditioning and you know, whatever. So we bring in these big name people. And then since the Navy had me for free, they'd always put me in the mix. Right. And they, like, you go lecture on sleep. And so I'd lecture on sleep, like I said, with a heavy tilt towards hormone and performance, but then I got to know all these other lecturers and uh, you know, we hit it off and we all had similar interests and thought similar, similarly about health and wellness and longevity and yeah, they invited me on their podcast and they'd recommend me for lectures. And then I started lecturing and then, you know, whatever, then, you know, whatever news channels, media, magazines, newspapers, all this stuff, find out about you word of mouth. And that, and I became this sleep guru, right. With a uh, sleep enthusiast. I like to call myself. I like, you know, uh, and there are doctors who are sleep specialists who go through a specialized training and they're diagnosing sleep disease, and there, there are a lot of sleep diseases, but most people don't have sleep diseases. Most people have unfortunate sequelae from not sleeping well uh, and poor right. sleep habits and other lifestyle habits. Uh, and, and it's been my experience that very, very, very rarely does somebody come to me when they have their, uh, they have their nutrition and their fitness, you know, they have their nutrition and their exercise and their stress mitigation all under control and they can't sleep. They almost never happens. Like it's always, there's always a big lifestyle component when I'm helping people to sleep. So, you know, so that's where I ended up, you know, uh, I needed, I needed guys like, you know, Rob Wolf to help me with the nutrition because I was a nutrition expert. And so I, I could learn from him. And then when things got too complex, I just, Hey, go talk to Rob. Right. And I'd put him, put him on the phone with him and same thing with, you know, kind of all the lifestyle medicine. And then over the course of the years, I I've gotten better at all that. And I, and I'm pretty self-sufficient at handling, you know, sort of all the lifestyle stuff at this point, but that's what got me here. And, um, and yeah, when I was, when I was helping all the seals get off of Ambien, which by the way, was hugely successful in resolving their symptoms, hugely successful. And I got every single guy off of Ambien, but you know, the, the reason I ended up with the sleep supplement is because I couldn't just take away their ambient and say, suck it up, buttercup. You know, like that's right. it. You know, like I had to give them something else. And so I gave them, you know, I started with just vitamin D3 and I gave them that. And that was kind of helpful. And then I found, oh, magnesium is a cofactor for vitamin D3 reaction. So I gave them magnesium. And then I like, and just piecemeal over the course of several months, we came up with this stack of vitamins and nutrients and supplements that would help people sleep and it made it a lot easier for them to get off the of sleep drugs, but they're having to go buy it all over town. This is pre-Amazon. They buy, you know, 90 day supply of pills here, 30 day supply of the pill here. This was a powder that was a liquid. They couldn't really travel with it. It was a pain in the butt. And they just really harangued me into making a product for their convenience. And that's the only reason the sleep supplement exists uh, because I designed it to help them get off of sleep drugs. And then they liked it, wanted to keep using it. And I developed it for them. And surprisingly, it became a business. So that's the full story of uh, the, that's a full doc parsley pedigree right there. You got the whole thing. I don't know if you wanted the whole thing, but you got it. I love it. I love this story. I mean, it's, there's so many things there that we could, so many directions we could go into and and we'll talk more about your sleep remedy product. And uh, we got a a 10% off 
that uh, code for 10% off that we can share with you too. But if you're a person and you're trying different sleep, perhaps medications, um, I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you to stop taking that shit, but yeah. And, and Kirk isn't necessarily your doctor, but I'm not your doctor. I can't tell you to either, but I can recommend <laughs> that you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk to and your I doctor. Think, yeah. What comes up for me from your story that it, well, a lot of things do, but that that's relevant to the people listening, which are a lot of entrepreneurs, high performers, or people who aspire to be high performance is, um, we rely on the biomedical model and the practitioners of it, in other words, doctors, to kind of really help us with our health. And the reality is, like you mentioned, a lot of doctors, they don't know about sleep in particular. Um, they may not understand all the ramifications, like you mentioned, of Ambien Right. Yeah, it helps you sleep, but it affects <laughs> your sleep architecture, what fa- how long you spend in each phase of sleep, and that can have issues. And, and, and then you're talking about, you use the words functional medicine, integrative medicine. Uh, there's a lot of people who use that word who, you know, are really out there on, you know, they're a little hard to trust what they say. Yeah. Uh, I trust you because of I've just spoken to you many times and I've watched your Ted talk and, and I really respect and trust what you say about this stuff. And I feel like you've got a good balance between, okay, you've got the foundation of your medical training, you understand it, but then you also were dealing with these, these high performance guys, these seals, and you can't just, like you said, the ambient's not a good idea because it's messing up sleep architecture, but you can't just like, uh, so many doctors might just pump them up full of hormones, but then you tried some other things that aren't necessarily, uh, part of standard medical treatments or right. right. And, and you got a little uh, issues from, from the, the Navy doing that. What do you feel like someone needs to know who may be struggling with some lifestyle stuff, sleep in particular, when they go to their doctor and it's like, well, we did your labs, uh, maybe your cholesterol is a little bit high, maybe you kind of try to eat better. And, uh, right. you know, your testosterone shows up is, you know, 252 or whatever, and like you're in the normal range. Uh, so yeah. I don't see a problem here. What is a person, a high performer, need to know about, about their, their health in that way and relying on the medical system. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I think the most important part of that, you know, first I want to preface it by uh, something you and I've talked about offline, but I don't know if we've ever talked about in your podcast that, you know, I do do private consulting and it, it, you know, and it's, it's a pretty exclusive thing and it's an annual program uh, definitely not right for most people, but my my clientele are exactly who you're talking about, exactly who your clientele are. I mean, these are uh, they're really successful entrepreneurs, but most of them were, you know, previous helicopter pilots in the military, or jet fighters, or special forces, or Division One college athletes, or you know, these are people for the most part have been you know the top performers their whole lives, and um, you know when they come to see me, they're they're falling apart, but they still have a lot of willpower. They still have a lot of drive. They're still getting after it. And what they really want is for me to like fix them up real quick and then just let them, you know, let them get back to life. And it's like that what supplement should I take? Kirk? Yeah. It, and, that, and that's not the way it is. Right. Uh, now the benefit of this group being who they are is they will listen to every, every podcast and watch every Ted talk and read every book. And then they will fire questions at me nonstop for hours. And so it forces me to understand what's out there and what people are being taught. But you know, the most important aspect of, of all of this is, is to realize for entrepreneurs that you're you're using, you're essentially using your body as a way to carry around your brain as an entrepreneur, right? Like very few people are entrepreneurs making money by swinging a sledgehammer, right? Like uh, you're you're an entrepreneur, you're you're making decisions, right? And how are you making decisions? Well, 
One thing is you're communicating first so that you have the information to make the decision. And then you're trying to predict things in the future and you're trying to figure out, you know, what are the most likely outcomes uh, of this multivariant problem that I could do this or I could do that. But if I do this, that'll happen. I would do this. That'll happen. This could happen. This is what I need to work it out for. And it's a complex thing. Like I know I run, you know, I run a couple of businesses myself. I know exactly how that goes. It's very mentally taxing. And then you have to have the emotional resiliency to deal with things going wrong all the time, right? Every day, almost every day, something's not going the way you thought it should go or should be going and you got to fix that. So it's a very trying profession. And most of the, like I said, most of these people have, you know, some, some, you know, pretty significant fitness, you know, a lot of, a lot of my clients are, uh, you know, are Ironman competitors or former Ironman competitors, and they run businesses now, or they're just super high level CEOs or whatever it is, but they're people who, who their health, their health is important to them, but they have like this teenage uh, early twenties idea about what health is, right. You know, just, Mm. just work out, right. I'll just work out more. Train hard. I'll, I'll train hard and I'll eat more salad and that, and that's going to fix it. Like, there's a lot more to it than that. And so 90% of what I do is lifestyle. So when I, when I'm training people or when I'm working with people, I'm working with clients, I'm trying to explain to them, this body is a couple of hundred thousand years old, right? It evolves to be on this planet, to be awake during the day and asleep during the night. In fact, it evolves to be awake for 16 hours and sleep for eight hours. You're born into that contract, just like you're born into the contract that you're going to die one day. You don't, you don't get to negotiate that. You need eight hours of sleep for 16 hours of being awake. Everybody does. Doesn't, you can't be better than that. You can't hack your way out of that. If you think, if you're a 35-year-old biohacker, you've been an adult for like seven minutes and you're, you're saying, I've got 200,000 years of evolution wired and I know how to do better and I'm going to trick it and do this. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm like. And if you do happen to do something that leads to a little performance gain now, what are the downstream? What are the long-term effects of that? You don't know. Nobody knows. So I tell everybody it's 90% it's 90 lifestyle and it's not that complex. It's actually very simple. Now that doesn't make it easy, right? It's very hard to get your lifestyle in order. It's very difficult. It's very taxing. You have to do a lot of stuff you don't want to do. You have to track a lot of things that aren't really that interesting to you. But you really have to do this to get your lifestyle in order. It's a tough thing to do. It's simplistic in concept, but it's hard to it's hard to implement. And so it takes a long time to get your lifestyle in order. But once you do, it's like I said, it's exceedingly rare that people come to me and go, like, "I'm eating spot on. My nutrition is spot on. My exercise is very smart. Like I'm training with the trainer. I'm tracking my heart rate variability. I'm not, I'm not overtraining. I'm not training when I'm overtrained. I'm taking breaks. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Oh, and I meditate every day and I, you know, I, you know, whatever I'm, I'm religious. I pray. I have a strong sense of community and my stress level is nil, but I can't sleep. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And if it does happen, they probably have a sleep disease and they need to go see a sleep physician like who specializes in that. And that's not, that's not the case. Um, so the thing about sleep to recognize is that every single thing that you do, everything that you want to get better at, you get better at while you're asleep. You don't get stronger when you work out, you get weaker when you work out, right? You damage tissues when you work out, when you sleep, you repair those tissues. And based on how you damage those tissues, your brain and body are smart enough to go, Oh, the, these muscle fibers are being put through and an, an, an intense amount of tension and stress and they're rupturing because they aren't strong enough. So we're going to make them bigger and thicker and stronger so that they won't tear next time. And then you get stronger or they're super enduring. We're going to increase mitochondrial density and we're going to figure out a way to get things in and out of the cell faster. So that cell can last longer before being becoming toxic and damaged from exercise. So you actually get better while you're repairing and you're repairing while you're asleep. When you learn stuff, it's loosely in your head. When you go to sleep, you rehearse it, you form new neural connections, you start being able to associate that with other information that you know, you really, really understand it. And then you wake up the next day able to use that information a lot more efficiently. And, but most importantly, your prefrontal cortex, which is what makes us the smartest animal on the planet. Take out the prefrontal cortex and you're, you're dumber than a monkey. You're more like a deer. Uh, you know, you're like, you are just completely, 
you know, stimulus and response at that point. Like you, you don't think about the future. You definitely can't plan yet. You know, like, like none of that stuff happens. So what makes us the smartest animal on the planet is our prefrontal cortex. What's the area you guess of your brain that suffers the most from sleep deprivation? Your yeah, prefrontal PFCs. cortex. Obviously, it makes perfect sense that it would. What, what area of your brain is most inhibited by stress hormones? Right. Prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex, uh, Anthony Sapolsky calls it, or is it Robert, Robert Sapolsky? I, I always forget. I went to high school with, with Anthony Sapolsky, and Robert Sapolsky is the author, and I, I always mess it up. So Robert Sapolsky, he was sort of the, the uh, pioneer of the cortisol stress hormone uh, study. He's the author of Zebra, Why Zebras Don't Get Cancer and, and several other books. Um, and he calls the prefrontal cortex the simulator. Mm. Great metaphor. Because I can sit here and I can simulate things. I don't have to do them. You can invite me to jump off the roof of your building. I don't have to do it. <laughs> And I go, like, you, you, it could be really fun. Could be, but let me think about it. My simulation says we're going to die. I don't want to do that, right? So, you know, and, and that's, yeah, it's a glib example, but we can do, but we do it with everything, right? So again, the entrepreneur said like, oh, well, I got this much cash in the bank. I need this and I need that. I can't really afford both. So how am I going to juggle things around? Well, if I get this guy to give me these terms and then I do this and I put this off, then I can pay for that. And then I, when I'll get this extra revenue here, I can repay it. That's a complex problem, but you're, you're predicting the future. You're having to guess what's going to happen based on what you know today. And you're having to do math and you're having to solve complex problems. All of that's prefrontal cortex. And I just told you, you're born into this, you're born into this contract. You, you're awake and active for 16 hours. After that, you need eight hours to recover. If you don't recover 100% the next day, you're, you're actually waking up the next day worse than the day before. Does that make sense, right? Yeah. So I beat myself down for 16 hours. I'm diminished over what I woke up as, right? And now I don't get good sleep. The next day, I'm going to be even worse. This is really what we call aging, right? This is really what aging is. If you could recover 100% every night, fix everything that got broken, everything that got stressed, you wouldn't age, right? You would be the same person every day when you woke up. So you can't fix 100%. Like it doesn't work that fast. But this is the, sort of the minimum recovery we know, and specifically for the brain. So if you don't get that, so if I know the entire purpose of me sleeping tonight is to get my brain and body ready for tomorrow, and I know I need eight hours of sleep, but if I only get six hours of sleep, Tomorrow still comes. So what do I do? How do I do tomorrow? I release, stress, hor I re I <laughs> right. release stress hormones because right. stress hormones are catabolic. They're using all of my stored resources. Like my stress hormones use my, my stored resources to get me through an event. So the maximum stress, fight or flight, right? Tiger jumps out of the bushes. The only thing that matters is getting away from the tiger. No other physiologic function in your body matters. So your body and brain will sacrifice every function that doesn't entail you getting away from that tiger. One of the most important things it's going to sacrifice is your prefrontal cortex. Because if you start planning how you're going to get rid of that tiger, get rid of that, get away from that tiger, you're dead before you, before you finish thinking about the plan. So we inhibit this, right? Our brains don't work. You can ask somebody their phone number in a gunfight. They won't be able to tell you. I guarantee you, like your brain shuts off for this stuff. So if that's fight or flight, then your prefrontal cortex is useless. Well, what if you're 50% down there? Well, it's 50% as useless as it is up here. What if your stress hormone is like almost zero? Well, then you have the maximum prefrontal cortex function you could possibly have. So don't you want your stress hormones to be really low? Well, of course you do. Stress hormones are catabolic. Catabolic means we're taking complex things, we're breaking them down into small things, primarily as fuel. So I use my muscles, I break them down, I get amino acids because my body needs amino acids to continue its functions. That's catabolic. Anabolic means I go to sleep, I'm well nourished, I've damaged my muscles, and my body uses all the amino acids I eat and it builds new muscle fibers and more new, new muscle tissue. So I'm building up. So that's anabolic. So sleep should be highly anabolic. And it is. It's the most anabolic time of your day. And in fact, deep sleep is the exact opposite of fight or flight. Every hormone that's high during fight or flight is non-existent during deep sleep and vice versa. So when you wake up the next morning, you should have fairly low stress hormones. You should be anabolic. 
If you don't get enough sleep, the only way to have enough energy and resources that day is to secrete more stress hormones, which are catabolic. So you're breaking yourself down. You're also interfering with your brain's function. Now you run a high level of stress hormones. You try to go to sleep. You can't go to sleep because your stress hormones are too high. This is one of the rules. Stress hormones have to be at a certain level for you to even be able to fall asleep. And if you do manage to fall asleep, it won't be very high quality sleep. So now, even if you get eight hours, your stress hormones were so high, you only got the benefit of six hours. Now you're going to wake up tomorrow with even higher stress hormones. Every day, wake up with higher stress hormones. It gets harder to go to sleep. So now you're not sleeping well because you have high stress hormones and you have high stress hormones because you aren't sleeping well. And this is what that aging process is between like 45 and 55, when we're less metabolically resilient and we're still trying to live like we lived when we were 20 and you just watch people crash. This is what happens to the president of the United States. When you watch him age 20 years over the course of four, it's stress hormones and sleep. I don't know why anybody would want that job, but I'm glad some people (laughs) are willing to do it. Kirk, I love this conversation, man. And um, I actually put together like a, a, a stress series recently and and diving into some of this stuff, because it's like one of the things that just people aren't talking about, as you referenced earlier, the 35 year old biohacker trying to get out of sleeping by, you know, shining infrared light on his genitals or whatever, whatever, (laughs) whatever is going on. Yeah. Yeah, Butter in the coffee. Exactly. That's all you need. Um, (laughs) Exactly. If only only evolution would have thought of this in the last 200,000 years. (laughs) So dumb. So dumb. Yeah. Just, could have just uh, carry gold butter, especially exactly. anyway, but <laughs> it's a very special brand. But like, you, you know, as you're saying this, I mean, it resonates with me a lot because I've, I've lived this too with some of the traumas that I, I've been through. I haven't been a Navy SEAL or even in the military, although I have a ton of respect for uh, people who do that type of thing. And, and so many other people, I, I, you know, I feel like that what we're talking about right now is actually the when people, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much, but it's just like, why are people acting so crazy? And it's Mm -hmm. like, well, we've got a culture that is constantly running on stress hormones instead of repairing themselves. People who are looking, I remember uh, (laughs) listening to someone, um, I forget the exact context, but she was uh, like a social justice warrior type of person. She was like, I was up at 3 a.m. online because I couldn't sleep. And I saw this post and I got so angry about it. It's like somebody yeah, was yeah, wrong. Angry. Somebody on social media was wrong and I had to fix it. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. feel like it, we, we, you know, the jokes are funny about it. And I think most of us kind of, you know, even some of those people, they got to laugh at themselves sometimes. But the deeper sort of situation in here is we're, we're dealing with all this stress we're dealing with and and co and this I'm, I'm talking about pre COVID, right? Now right. we have the COVID stress, right? And uh, this I new think this new cycle, better. yeah, this new cycle that you know, especially in America, like I know you're not in, I know you're not in America right now, but you know, this new cycle that COVID's going to kill you. Now there's this new variant that's going to kill you. Now, you know, now climate can climate change is going to kill you, and racism is going to kill you, sexism is going to kill you, homophobia is going to kill you. Like everything's going to destroy, everything's falling apart. Carry on, like have a great life, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, nobody they don't you give know, you a solution. The, the, no. the economy is about to collapse. The inflation, everything, like everything. If this president wins, we're all going to die. If that president wins, we're all going to die. Like it totally. Everybody, you know, they're just thriving on this this fear cycle because it just leads to people, you know, not being able to think. Like I said, when you're in fight or flight, you don't think. And what's more Pavlonian than just keep hitting the refresh and scrolling that news feed. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for that dopamine hit to tell you that everything's going to be all right, but you just keep getting more stress response, more amygdala stimulation. Oh, that's, Oh, here's something else that's wrong. Oh, here's another harbinger of something really terrible about to happen. Oh, here's another awful thing. Somebody did to someone else. It's the most unhealthy thing in the world, man. I mean, I think there's a lot of benefits to technology, but it, it, and this has always been the case. It's always kind of gotten out of hand and then it gets reined back in, becomes more responsible. You know, that this happened with rural electrification and happened with the highway systems. It happened with 
all uh, you know, telephones that happen with cable television. I mean, every, everything just goes too far and gets rained back in. Hopefully this gets rained back in pretty quickly because it's definitely gone way too far at this point. Yeah. And, um, you know, what we're talking about, it's uh, it, a lot of it, you know, we, we have to keep our shit together mm-hmm. while, while it's being reined in, while, you know, culture shifts back and forward. And, and we have right. no, can, that, I, the only control I feel like we really have over it is like, okay, well, what, what can I do? Well, what kind of, how can I take care of myself? And certainly if, if you want to participate in the world being a better place, it, it, making sure your prefrontal cortex is working so that you're making decisions based on evaluating data and, and not being emotionally driven by something that could be out of context or, you know, not having all the information. And you can take this, and, and this doesn't matter what side you're on, by the way, or if you're in the middle without where we're where I kind of feel like I am, but it doesn't matter where you are. This is a more fundamental, like what we're talking about here is the fundament, like you said, the contract that you're born into, you don't get to control how this works. And most people, we, I mean, you gotta, I gotta, well, I didn't come, you know, they don't give you instructions for your max, but you know, there's like a whole thing that I could go and, and figure out how to use my Mac better and go to the genius right. bar and all that. But <clears throat> with human beings, we, we don't really get, we don't really get trained in school, like how to take care of our bodies and the importance of sleep. Or if we do, it's very rudimentary and maybe not the best information. Uh, Kirk, I think a good, a good question is what are some really important signs? I, I want to preface my question by saying this. I, I remember talking to uh, a doctor I was seeing in uh, in Miami. We were talking about a patient he had, and he was asking her about her anxiety or stress or whatever. And she said, "What are you talking about? I'm not stressed at all." What he pointed out to her was, "Well, you're, you're you've been chewing on your lip for yeah. the past the entire time." Right. And so what are some, so we're lacking awareness about it. We think we're not stressed. No, I don't feel stressed. In fact, I said this earlier and speaking about, I saw teeth indentations in my lower lip and I don't even, I'm not, it's unconscious. Right. Right. So even though my life is pretty good by the way, and and, you know, uh, but what are some things that a person needs to pay attention to some warning signs like, Hey, my stress or my sleep or both are just out of whack. What are some things, some common, like, Oh, I need to do something about this. This is a red flag. Right. So, you know, the, the unfortunate side of that is that uh, the unfortunate aspect of this answer is that stress can simulate any symptom, anything, Mm. visual changes, taste and smell changes, Stomach aches, weakness, fatigue, headaches, diarrhea, vertigo. Like it doesn't matter. It, anything, anything. Stress can simulate anything. So I feel safe in saying that if you haven't been working, actively working, have some significant training to lower your stress hormones and maintain good autonomic control throughout the day, if you haven't been training for that for Three to five years, your 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 stress aren't your stress isn't as good as it could be, right? I think the more direct question, the more helpful thing is to just focus on sleep because we know nothing will lower your stress hormones more than sleeping well, and then having a well rested brain will allow your brain to function better the next day. And when your brain functions better the next day you will be less likely to stress out over things because really what stress means is either you feel like something is happening right now that you can't handle or that what's happening right now is a sign that something is about to happen that you can't handle. Mm. So the more capable you feel, the better your brain is working, the more healthy, energetic you feel, and your brain is functioning. You can remember, you can solve problems, you can predict, you can, right? So the more capable you feel, the less stress you're going to have the next day. And so the first thing I would say, now the easy, the easy uh, academic answer is test your heart rate variability. You can find out if your heart rate variability is super low, 
It's almost certainly from stress. There are a few cases where it could be parasympathetic dominant, but almost certainly it's sympathetic dominant. We can talk about that in, in a minute if you want. But I tell everybody, if you aren't going to sleep at approximately the same time every night and you aren't waking up, at approximately the same time every day without the need for an alarm clock. Now, I don't necessarily recommend not having an alarm clock, but you know you're going to wake up within 20, 30 minutes of that alarm, whether you have an alarm clock or not. Unless that's true, then your sleep isn't optimized. So let's go for the biggest, the biggest hammer first, right? The biggest thing you can do to not only lower your stress hormones and improve your performance, but what else does sleep do? It's appetite regulator, right? So, mm -hmm. and it affects insulin sensitivity and it affects fuel partitioning. So it's, it's really good for your nutritional status to just get better sleep. Exercise, same thing. More resilient, the, more, the better rested you are, the better repaired you are, the better your hormones are balanced, the stronger you are, the faster you are, the more enduring you are. So your exercise is more beneficial for you. And then stress mitigation. Again, you're trying to control your stress. You're trying to control your brain. You're trying to control your ruminative thoughts about what could possibly go wrong. These are all stress provoking things. The better your brain's working, the better you can control those things. The fewer stress hormones you have, the better you can control those things. So let's, the first thing is optimize sleep because it, it affects the other three pillars of health equally. So do that first. Once you say, well, I'm, I'm spot on with my sleep. And I know that I can basically go to sleep about the same time every night. I feel really well rested. I wake up with, you know, within about a 30 minute window, the same every day. Okay. Now, now I believe your stress is under control. Now let's find something specifically. You tell me what is the performance detriment that you have, right? What isn't going quite right for you? Do you have a little more fat than you like? Let's handle that individually. Do you feel more emotional than you like? Let's talk about that. Do you, you know, but the foundation first is to get the sleep in order. Uh, after that, I would go by symptomatology of like whatever it is about your life that isn't working. One of my friends has this great quote. He says, everything in your life that's inconsistent with your goals will reveal itself over time. Mm -hmm. At some point, great quote. Some point, something you're doing doesn't work for where you want to go. What is that? Let's work with that one on one. Like maybe that's a nutritional area issue. Maybe that's a you know, stress control, mitigation, maybe something we can fix with meditation. Maybe that's something about your exercise routine. Who knows? Like that could be a vitamin mineral deficiency. Like let's, let's dig into it then when we find out what it is that isn't working for you. Yeah. Great advice. And um, another thing, I don't know, talking about this sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, measuring HRV, if we should go down that route. I had a uh, I don't know if you probably know Dr. Mike. Oh my gosh, I can't remember his last name right now. Um, but Dr. I just call him Dr. Mike. The the is it the PhD Dr. from the University of Texas? I think that's him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. got a PhD. I, I I don't remember what university he was from, but he's heavy into uh HRV and HRV training. But so um, I I have a I have a very simplistic way sure. of explaining this. I think your audience will dig. So you have, you have this autonomic, because we like to use words that people don't understand, it's job security. Just think of it as automatic, right? It's controlling my heart rate, it's controlling my blood pressure, it's controlling my kidney function, my liver function, like all this stuff is being controlled by a nervous system that I'm not aware of, right? And it has, this, has this a part that slows things down, essentially, and it has a part that speeds things up, essentially, right? Sympathetic, think of S for speed, speeds everything up. Parasympathetic slows you down. So it, it's really that easy. Like we call the parasympathetic, the rest and digest and the sympathetic, the fight or flight, which is like that maximum stress. Somebody shooting at you, just got in a car crash, getting a fist fight, you know, wild animal chasing you. That's fight or flight, maximum, maximum sympathetic tone. So your heart has a node in it that causes your heart to beat with no input from anything else. It'll just beat on this node. And that beat is going to be around 40 to 45 beats per minute. You know, it's a pretty slow pace, but it'll keep you alive, right? Now, this doesn't need input from your nervous system. It's just going to keep doing its thing. And so you can sever your spinal cord right below your neck and your heart will keep going, right? So this node sets this really slow rate. 
Now, you always have some sympathetic tone, right? Because stress hormones keep you alive. They get this bad rap for like this negative word stress, but they keep you alive, right? You can't be alert and awake and pay attention to your environment without some stress hormones. And so some stress hormones are always going to be in your body and they're going to cause your heart rate to beat faster sometimes because there's going to be a lot of these stress hormones going away around and they're depending on when the heart beat and the blood flow passes the node and what, how much, you know, adrenaline is in that or whatever. There's a lot of variability, but like every now and then that node's going to fire a little faster because the stress hormones are causing the heart to beat instead of just the sync, not synchronicity, which the, whatever, you know what I mean? The, the, the programming of that node, instead of that node firing it, the stress hormones cause it to fire. So it beats faster that time. If you have a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, it's not one beat every second. Sometimes it's a little before the second, sometimes a little mm. after the second. That's heart rate variability. If I can't predict if my heart's going to beat two tenths of a second before that second or two tenths of a second after that second, and it's going to vary back and forth, that's a lot of variability. That's a high heart rate variability, which means I have sympathetic tone going in there, my parasympathetic tone going in there too. So like my, my slow parasympathetics that's going to just keep my heart beating at a pretty slow rate, sympathetics is going to make it beat faster. Sometimes the sympathetics make it beat faster. Sometimes the parasympathetic make it beat slower. That's balanced, high heart rate variability. Now, if I'm super stressed, my stress hormones cause it to beat every time. So and even if it's not fast, it's, it's always firing consistent and right. it's right on the second. So now I'm beating 60 beats per minute right on. And I have a heart rate variability of zero. Now, mm. these are extremes. It's not, you know, neither one of those cases happened, but that's what, that's what you're looking at. So that's the balance between this automatic nervous system in our body, the parasympathetic, it's trying to slow you down, get you to chill out, lay on the couch eat some nachos and sleep or this parasympathetic, like let's get after it and do important, scary things. So those balance, if you have a high heart rate variability, that means that your nervous system is balanced, which means you can go train and you can stress your body and you know that you're not sort of overtraining and damaging yourself. But it also means that your brain is functioning the best that it can, right? Your prefrontal cortex is going to be shut down. If your heart rate variability is low, your problem solving skill is low, your concentration is low, your emotional control is low, your communication abilities are low because your prefrontal cortex does all of that stuff and it's impaired by stress hormones. Such a great answer there. Yeah. Um, I love how you simplified it. You've had, you, you've had some practice yeah, <laughs> a lot of practice simplifying this stuff. So it's great. So understanding there's that balance in HRV is is okay. Are are both sides working well together, or are you do you have less variability because your stress hormones are high and you're just your your heart is really beating consistently without that that variability that's indicative of of that other side that rest and digest parasympathetic side. Kirk, um, I use an aura ring. Uh, mm -hmm. It gives me HRV, but, it, but Mike pointed out when he was on the show, you, you're not taking it at the same time. It gets, you could, if you're sleeping for six hours, I know you we're not supposed to do that, Kirk, yeah. but, you know, or we're sleeping with eight hours. The data is off. It's not consistent data. So he recommended, um, you know, taking it with, with a different, app like what would you tell what do you what do you think in terms of measuring do you like to, uh, to measure do you like to track do you like the aura what do you like now for people to get some type of solid data to make a decision about okay do is this something that i really need to work on or not Right. Well, so for me, uh, and, and I have clients that range all over the board, right? I, I have clients that don't have any interest in technology whatsoever. You know, like they, like they founded the, the, the garbage, the garbage truck, you know, uh, waste disposal of the city they live in and they're uber rich, but they don't know a damn thing about anything technological and they don't care. Like they get trucks to their locations, they buy and sell stuff and buy real estate and all that. So and then I have people that are like super techie, man. You know, they run a digital marketing agency and they know every device that comes out. They get, you know, they have buddies that work at all the 
uh, that work in the industry to get them, you know, get them the, uh, the prototype of everything that's come out and they just love technology. So, and I don't care. I'm completely agnostic. I, what I, what I tell people is you have to be able to track it. So I care about consistency more than I care about accuracy. So whether or not your aura ring is more or less act accurate than a Garmin watch or an Apple watch, or, you know, one of the programs in your mattress or your iPhone, like, I don't care. Like, I really don't care. You know, I'm not going to diagnose a sleep disorder off of some home tracking unit. So uh, sure. what, what I care about is consistency. So, you know, all these things are algorithm based when they're telling you if you've done well or done poorly. I wouldn't pay any attention to that. Like, like I said, if you can go to bed around the same time every night and wake up about the same time every day and you wake up feeling refreshed and you feel great and your aura, aura gives you a score of 80%, well, that's your ideal, right? And 100% probably isn't going to be better for you. 100% is going to fit their algorithm better, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be better for you. So for you, like, Excellent point. it's just consistency. So like, is my heart rate variability getting progressively better? Is it getting progressively worse? You know, is it, is it aligning with the times that I know I'm under stress? Like that's, yeah, that's useful information. I, I, again, I wouldn't care about the accuracy as much as I can care about the consistency. So if you wear the ring every day, you, if you wear the ring every night, you know, you'll do that. Well, then we're going to get consistent data. That's what we care about. So it's like, I'm worried that I'm not getting enough sleep. All right, we fixed that. Now I'm worried I'm not recovering well enough, so I want to check my heart rate variability. Well, if it's only 80% accurate, but it's consistent, and we know every day, like right, this is the best is the best I ever get is around here. Okay, well, you know what consistently gets you to the best? We can start playing with around with your exercise. We can play around with your you know stress mitigation during the day. We can play around with nutrition. There's all sorts of stuff we can play around with at that point if you know that your sleep's on. So, like I said. I I have clients that they journal. I, I say, write down what time you go to sleep, write down what time you wake up, write down anything you remember happening in the night, write down how you feel. And then before you go to bed the next day, just kind of write down, it can be a one sentence. It's like, generally, how did you feel that day? Was that a good, a high performing day, a poor performing day? Did you, right? And that's it. And they do that. And it's consistent. If they'll be consistent with it, it's just as useful for me as if you have a Garmin and an Omega and a, the, and a Aura and you, you run it all through seven computer filters and AI. Like it's, it's, the, same, it's the same amount of information for me. It, it's really just a matter of paying enough attention to track it, being consistent about tracking it. And you can, you know, the nuances will reveal themselves. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I tend to be a little bit uh, promotional about the aura, even though I don't. I don't have any re- affiliate relationship with them. I, I, I love. I love the product. I, I think. Yeah. I think it's the most accurate product out there because it samples on the. It's the only one that measures arterial blood, as far as I know, um, because it's so close to the skin. You can get arterial, and because there's really no fat in the crease of your finger doesn't take much energy. So it samples more frequently and it goes arterial, which is just the higher quality of measurement. And, and I know Harpreet well, the the founder of the company. So I'm a big fan of it. They don't make it in my size. So I don't wear one. Uh, I tried wearing a pinky ring for a while and just annoyed me. So, um, (laughs) so I keep telling her, how tall are you? I'm only six one, but I, I have, uh, big feet and big hands, man. I, I wear a 14 ring and they make a 13. Yeah, you know, whatever. I wear a 14 shoe and a 14 ring. So maybe, maybe I'm symmetrical. I don't know. Yeah. And John Wellborn's the same way. He's uh, my, my NFL buddy that I work out with out here. We both had breakfast with Harpreet. We're like, come on, man, make us a 14. Surely they're, they're like, they're like, dude, we give these rings to athletes all over the world. Nobody needs a 14. So you're like, there's not <laughs> enough of you. I was going to say, that's I'm a like, huge foot size, man. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I was definitely supposed to be taller. I'm sure because like a 14 on six one is just ridiculous looking. My son has a 16, but he's he's like probably my six five. So like it doesn't look that different. Makes sense. Him, you know? yeah. yeah. And everyone in my family is really tall. So I'm like I'm the I'm the shortest one. Besides my my oldest son, he got completely genetically robbed somehow. I I have no idea how it happened. No, he's just by far the shortest person on either side of either family for, for generations. So I don't know what happened. I did my part. Yeah. 
<laughs> so important takeaway, if you wear a size 14 for a ring, uh, forget about the aura. You, you can do the pinky. You can do the pinky if you can Oh, you can it. do the pinky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're, my, you're up for the pinky ring. Yeah. My, my, the, the pinky, they had plenty of, plenty of room on, you know, there, there's a significant size difference there. I think my pinky was only like 11 or something. So that works fine, but I just, it was annoying. And pinky I, ring. I, I just, yeah. yeah. I know it, it, was, it was something I could never quit paying attention to. Like it was always on my head, you know, now, like when you wear a watch, you forget you have a watch on, but like that, I could never, I could never forget I had it on. It was always, uh, always affecting me. So yeah. But. Right. <laughs> so there you go. Might, might exclude some of you from, from getting the aura, but uh, it's endorsed by Doc Parsley as well. So Kirk, man, thanks so much for today. I feel like we've covered so much, although I feel like we could easily cover a lot more. If you're interested, well, you've got my number. We can always re, we can always do another. Let's like, do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always happy I would to love talk. to. Yeah, would well, love to. Just, I love speaking. We'll just set to it up. You. Get your audience to throw questions out there too, and we'll you know try to answer you know what your audience wants to hear as well as what we want to talk about. So more than happy to do it, brother. I would love that. Let me not throw in too many things, perhaps because I want to. I want to promote you right now. If you are a person, by the way, and you're you're feeling run down, and you know, uh, listening to, you know, biohacking or whatever, listening to all the podcasts. I can't come up with a joke right now. It's yeah, <laughs> uh, been too good of an interview, but if you're trying all those things, if you're listening to podcasts and trying to D Y I it, and it's just not working. Uh, go to docparsley.com. That's D O C P A R S L E Y.com. And, hey, and, um, and if I could just plug something there real quick. Um, yeah, sure. We, we didn't get into it, but the most common thing in my experience, and I've, I've been, you know, I've been coaching people and helping people sleep for uh, 12 years now. Uh, and by far the most common thing I run into is, is stress, right? People are, they have too high stress hormones. They're a little too stressed when they're going to sleep. And it leads to that cycle I was talking about earlier. So I have, if you go docparsley.com forward slash, forward slash stress, mm -hmm. I have a downloadable PDF on there. It would take me an hour to explain it, but um, a downloadable PDF that will help you control your stress around bedtime and minimize the amount of stress you have while you're asleep. And then the daytime is your own bag to figure that out. Like that's a whole nother topic, but uh, it's about sort of setting up your life and routine and the ritualization around sleep and uh, your, your thoughts around sleep and your thoughts during you know, while you're trying to fall asleep. And so it's, it's a, uh, it's a pretty simplistic thing to do, but it takes a little time to set up. Um, but anybody can do it. You just need a piece of paper and a pen and, uh, and you can, uh, you can do it. And it, it seems, it seems ridiculously simple, but it's the most powerful tool I have. It's more powerful than hormones or peptides or supplements or, you know, float tanks or H bot or saunas or anything like that. Like the thing that helps people get to sleep is this silly worksheet. So I love it. Try that. And that's go. free. That's free. Download just it. check it out. Like, yeah. Don't just go download it. So docparsley.com slash stress. Yep. So D-O-C-P-A-R-S-L-E-Y.com slash stress. Go and get that. Kirk, thanks so much, man. It's just always great talking to you. You just, uh, not only do you know your stuff, but you know how to communicate it in a way where, um, you know, we, we can understand. So really yeah. appreciate you. Uh, love this story about the SEALs and, and can't wait till we talk again next time, man. Yeah, man. My pleasure. I uh, look forward to it. Let's do it soon. That's it for today, my friend. I hope you learned a lot about how to improve and optimize your sleep. Always a pleasure having Dr. Kirk Parsley on the show. Definitely got to get him back sooner rather than later. Now on Friday, it's time for another Real Talk conversation. And this time I'm going to talk to you about the five fat loss mistakes to avoid. And of course, I'm going to tell you what you should do differently. So if you're wondering why your fat loss process, your fat loss journey is so difficult, I'm here to tell you this. It's because you're making mistakes. 
It's not your metabolism. It's not your age. It's none of those excuses that I've used in the past and that you're using right now. The thing that I learned is that I wasn't doing the right strategies. And if you want to find out what to do instead, tune in this Friday and you're going to learn a lot. Have an amazing week. Speak to you then. Okay, I've got something exciting to share with you. Over the past few months, my team and I have been working hard behind the scenes to create something special for you, my listeners. If you're an executive, entrepreneur, or other high performer looking to lose 20 to 30 pounds of fat, transform your body, and to do it all without giving up your favorite foods or your social life in the process, then you're going to want to hear this. I've never done anything like this before, but I'm confident it's going to help you win big with your health in 2022. So if you're excited to see what I have planned to help you, go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash Facebook to join my exclusive Facebook group. Again, that's legendarylifepodcast.com slash Facebook. See you inside.